We're excited to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the J. Reuben Clark Law Society. We started with a few chapters. Now we have over 200 chapters in more than 23 countries. The mission statement of the society is, is inspired. It is to uh, affirm the strength brought to the law by a lawyer's personal religious conviction and then to strive through public service and professional excellence to promote fairness and virtue founded upon the rule of law. Its mission statement, I think, makes a lawyer feel unembarrassed to merge religious convictions, uh, to bring together one's religious convictions and one's professional training to assist in um, effecting the resolution of legal disputes. The mission statement of the J. Reuben Clark Law Society will carry us a long way because it's based on truth. We identified uh, people in each of the major metropolitan areas of the U.S. and decided that, uh, that I, as the dean, ought to go meet them and that maybe they could call a meeting of interested persons, even if it were only a, a tiny handful of people, some of their friends. When we talked about uh, an organization that kind of reflected what the BYU Law School was about, uh, with the name of J. Raymond Clark, that would attract the interest of LDS lawyers and those who shared their values. People like that began to pop up, and they, they, we, I remember seeing them in Phoenix, in Washington, D.C. Uh, they were all over the place. It was already a national organization, and to have that uh, association, uh, well, that was my version of what I think the Law Society became later on. I think we're celebrating the 30th year, and I was, had the privilege of being present 30 years ago in Washington, D.C. at the Mayflower Hotel when uh, Rex Lee, Ralph Hardy, I believe Elder Jeff Holland, President Jeff Holland at the time, Bruce Hafen, and others of us gathered together. I, can, I still have the program from that event. And it was exciting. And I remember uh, my wife and I, we had six children and lots of other things to do with our life, but we thought, this is really important, this is fun. And as Bruce Hafen had said, we didn't have any alum you know, to look up to as a charter class, so we really liked the fact that there were others of the same persuasion to do this. And, you know, some people said, well, most Mormons don't like lawyers, and most lawyers don't like Mormons. Here's a bunch of Mormon lawyers. These are the only friends we got. You have to recognize and pay tribute to, to Ralph Hardy, from whom the idea came, and for Bruce Hafen, who caught on to the idea quickly, and for their willingness to pursue this idea that seemed impossible to pull off, frankly. Uh, in the early, in the early times, but uh, they were they were just simply visionary. Um, Gary Anderson uh, had gone to BYU as an undergraduate, and then to Bolt Hall to Berkeley, and he practiced in San Francisco. And when he practiced there, there were no other uh, attorneys that could act as mentors to him, or very few, and especially those very few who were members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints who, with whom he could kind of bounce off ethical questions that he had or procedural questions who could act as um, helpful to him as he became integrated with the bar. And so one of, a part of his vision was that the Law Society, those senior members of the bar could become mentors to people just coming out of law school. And when they had questions, rather than having to learn by trial and error, they could go to them and say, I have this situation that's come up. Do you have some advice for me? I think that we can, we can really take the Law Society to another level. And um, as I traveled home from D.C. to New York, I took the train. And I sat on the train, and I remember just as the countryside, Delaware, New Jersey, were going by, 
I typed out an email and I laid out all of these ideas of what I thought the Law Society could encompass and could become with the focus to be more than just a networking or a quasi-alumni or a, 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 a group of LDS Lawyers Association meeting once in a while to talk about common things and get some CLE, but how do we take the Law Society to something else? And that document, I still have it, I've saved that email, that was the almost the charter or the constitution of what I felt like I was involved in for the next four years. One of the great ideas that he thought about was to have a directory. I didn't know who to look for in Boise or in Portland, Oregon or in Los Angeles necessarily. And Bill said, well, let's put a, a directory together. And that was developed. And that's been a great tool. Here we tried a, a conference involving uh, an invitation to all of the members of the J. B. Clark Law Society and we had a, a great response to that. It turned out really well. Elliot Crawford, uh, emeritus member of the 70, came as our keynote speaker and it was held at a hotel one day and at Georgetown Law School the next day and, and hundreds of people came and and that was the beginning of the annual conference of the J. Wynn Clark Law Society. I started to come out to the leadership conference every year and it was, uh, it was a, a wonderful uh, changing event for me. I got to meet people, I saw the vision of the Law Society, what it can be and the influence that it can have. And to see the influence of the Law Society in the lives of lawyers you know, all over the world was really remarkable. And uh, to be in common cause with all of them was it's tremendous. One of the other things I think is amazing about the Law Society is the growth of committees. When I first became involved 24 years ago, I don't think we had any standing committees. It was the international chair and a vice chair. And over the course of 25 years and the different leadership styles of our international chairs, we now have, I think it's about 10 standing committees, which is incredible. A lot of work gets done there. And Gary was a natural at, uh, at uh, encouraging that type of activity, networking. And so he made it a point to, to know the law firms, the government agencies, the county attorneys, the U.S. attorneys. There, there are countless numbers of places where legal employment is available. And so, so Gary focused on those things and was able, I think, to give the law society a good start a good jumping off point to uh, provide employment to the BYU law graduates. My recollections about the start of women in law goes back to a leadership uh, conference years ago, and I believe it was Jeff Shields that came and talked to me about something they were doing in Orange County. He, he said that they needed to bring their women into the Law Society more and more. A lot of us felt that if we're not practicing law, we don't belong here. Or we're trying to be in law and we don't have time for other things. But we found that women in law gave great support to women who were legally trained, whether they were practicing law, whether they had ever sat for the bar, let alone passed it. And Elizabeth Smith, I believe, was the one working in Orange County with Jeff uh, Shields, and they established a women in law organization. So women in, the, in law um, events are not just for women. The ones that I attend in Salt Lake frequently are attended by men as well, but it's put on by women in law. The other event that they put on that is excellent is the pre-law event the night before, Wednesday night before the Thursday, Friday leadership conference. Women in law also have a breakfast at the annual uh, conference each year. And we end up spending all of the time just going around having everybody introduce themselves and tell their story because that's so inspiring and educational to know different options and how it can be handled that also sets up that networking 
throughout the conference and beyond that they have somebody that they can talk to and say, what you did is what I plan to do. Tell me how you did it and, and what the hard parts and what the easy parts and how to make it happen. I believe the Mexico City chapter was the first uh, what I would consider an international chapter. We had uh, a chapter in, a couple of chapters in Canada, as I recall, but certainly Mexico City was the first in Latin America. And of course, since then, the, uh, our presence in Latin America has just exploded. We have a half dozen or so chapters in Brazil and more in formation. One of the chapters in Curitiba has as its chair a, a great lawyer who's not a member of the church. Uh, we've got a good presence in uh, Peru. We have a chapter, a couple of chapters in Central America. Uh, Greg Clark has been responsible for a good part of that. He was, was a very dynamic presence in Latin America when he served as the church's council in Brazil. We, were, we had about 30, 35 chapters on one continent. Basically it was um, U.S. and Canada and I think one chapter in Mexico. Uh, but then it took off in South America and through uh, Neville Rokau in uh, uh, Australia and New Zealand. And uh, so the Peru chapter in South America was the first recipient of our pro bono award for the good work that they had done in their community. The biggest accomplishments that I can point to are the growth internationally of the Law Society. Mexico just exploded. We had a wonderful uh, regional legal council in Mexico who was so excited to help the Law Society grow. And he would meet with different attorneys in different, all over Mexico and they were excited to get together. They had no idea that there were other LDS attorneys. And then in January 2016, they invited me to come down and participate in the first Mexico Regional Conference. And again, it was several hundred attorneys who were be together and they didn't know that there were so many other attorneys out there. Um, I also participated in the first uh, regional conference in London and Charlotte Steinfeld chaired that and that was a wonderful event. Elder Oaks came and spoke there. Um, Elder Oaks came and spoke at the, the Mexico regional conference. So the, the brethren have been very supportive of the Law Society. Where we were in London meeting in the Hyde Park Chapel and we had lawyers from Scotland who rode the train all day to get there to this meeting because they heard about this meeting of lawyers who were members of the church and they didn't know there was anybody but them who was a lawyer and a member of the church and so they traveled all day to get there and we and we had a, a very large meeting and uh, we had uh, lawyers from London and the surrounding areas but also lawyers from up in uh, the Preston area of the church uh, I don't remember from Wales, but we, we may very well have had someone from, from Wales. And they just came and they were, they were stunned to see how many members of the church there were who were lawyers in the United Kingdom. I mean, they, they, were, they were literally blown away. Uh, they had no idea there were so many. And, and so there, there was a, a great bond of, of uh, friendship. That, that, that originated that night for them. One of the things I was proudest of was, it was nothing I did, but I was smart enough to say to Doug Bush and Nancy Van Sloten, you've got a great idea to do student chapters. We've only had lawyers that already graduated. Nancy and Doug, let's do more student chapters. And it all I had to do was stand back, and of course, Nancy and Doug can do anything. And so we began, we almost overnight doubled the size of the Law Society. It's one of those things kind of like, of course we should have students there. I pushed, I pushed to have the law student chapters also because I thought that it was important to get them 
kind of started, that's their training wheels for the Law Society membership when they graduate. I was amazed at the number of LDS law students that attended. So I think their involvement at the national level when they can come here and, and network and meet people that would be role models, people that carry the faith and live the faith, who are articulate and are able to be inspirational to them, I think that's one of the greatest things the society can do. thought, wow, there is a way to integrate my professional life and my personal life together, but there's a way to give expression to that. I can, there's an outlet, there's an organization that through um, promoting pro bono service or religious liberty or just being a good person as a lawyer and bringing to the law one's religious conviction, there's a way to bridge that, and it's the J. Room Clark Law Society. One of the great <clears throat> blessings of my life has been working with the Clark Memorandum. Um, I was the editor of the Clark Memorandum for a number of years, and, and I quickly saw that, that perhaps the, the most interesting things to members of the Law Society were the talks given by senior judges, by general authorities, people who had practiced law for years, but also had a very um, in-depth understanding of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So it became both intellectually stimulating and spiritually stimulating to me. I think it's called Life in the Law, Answering God's Interrogatories. And I think there's three volumes now, but it's volumes that have all the talks that brethren have given, others, not just the brethren, that are relevant to practicing law. LDS Perspectives on the Law, we were trying to put together an institute program, lesson plans for LDS law students. Uh, and we have about, I think there's 15 or 16 there. I've had the opportunity to interact with members of the Law Society who to this day chair pro bono, their, the pro bono undertakings and work with them uh, for the assistance of refugees and others who, whom we're try, trying to serve. But really what stands out for me is the, the wonderful people and the examples that they are, how they balance their, their work, their church responsibilities, their family responsibilities. It's, it's not an easy thing being a member of the church and being a parent and being an active church member and being a, a, a busy professional. It's not an easy thing. Um, and, and for me, I'm a stay-at-home mom and have been for the past 10 years, but it's been a way for me to engage in the legal community and, and learn about some of these issues and be a part of these issues while, while staying home with my kids. And so I've, been, I've really cherished and valued the time that I've had to be part of, of the Law Society at this time. Uh, we, we live in, a, in such a contentious, negative time that uh, voices that, that live on a higher plane, seek a higher road, and want to give more to society than they take, those voices will be the kind of invisible, but I hope not always unspoken, fabric that will keep things together so that uh, all the institutions that we value, the freedoms we value, will, will be in better hands.